So the Tanya that we're learning, this is a, a very Kabbalistic text that is a full life system of how to operate at the highest level in terms of being a soul flowing through a body. And it's separated, as we said, into two major sections. The first was the technique, the how do you do this? How do you always function at the highest possible level, have perfection, in fact, in thought, speech, and action? which puts you at the level of being defined as a Bainani. Your thought, your speech, and your action are always completely other-centered, always completely productive, doing the best you can in the world. That was chapters 1 to 34. Of course, it's all on our classes. It's all back uh, on, on YouTube and everywhere else, so feel free to follow, ask questions, uh, send them in to me. I'd love to discuss. And now this second section, we want to learn things like why. What does it matter if I'm a good person or a bad person? What's the point? Right? And also what? Okay, I've learned how to meditate, but what exactly do I meditate on? What, what are the topics I should put into this technique of meditation I've learned to let my bina, my, my cogitative process of my soul, open up and go deeper and deeper into the details, into the depths of the idea of the divine concept? And what emotions are available for me to use to elevate all the Torah, all the mitzvah that I do, whether a temple or, or elsewhere. And we went through and we learned uh, more of a, a philosophical worldview about why it's important, what the purpose of creation is, to make a dira bitachtanim, to make a home for God right here in the physical world, not the spiritual worlds. We also learned many uh, topics, many types of meditation that we can engage in in order to inspire many specific types of emotions to elevate the work that we're doing. And now finally we get to the end, and the Alter Rebbe, our guide here, our mentor, the author, is uh, coming back to the very beginning of this second section, chapter 35, where he described this, this figure in the, in the Zohar, this figure in, in our greatest Kabbalistic book, this child that was born with complete spiritual knowledge, complete uh, vision of everything about the Torah and the world. And the Yenuka described that if a human being is a lamp, a lamp of God, the components were the physical body was the wick, the uh, light, the flame that's burning, that is the dwelling of God's presence above my head, above our head, hopefully. And then the oil that keeps that flame connected to the wick, that is mitzvahs, mitzvahs. And the author is bothered because most of the time oil is compared to chokhmah, chokhmah, not mitzvahs. So chokhmah, learning insight, not putting a coin in a charity box. So now he wants to go deeper into that concept, reconcile that, that, uh, that uh, problem. And in doing it, he's going to explain to us what it really means for the Shekhinah to dwell on something. For the Shekhinah to dwell on something. So last week we went into, uh, went into this question. Uh, we looked at uh, uh, essentially the relationship between the soul and the body as a metaphor that will explain the relationship of God and creation and how it is that God can have something called a Shekhinah that's dwelling someplace more than some other place. And it's a powerful question because, as I said last week, ask, ask uh, any three-year-old or any four-year-old in our early childhood center, is God right here? The answer is, yeah, God's everywhere. Right? Is, God, is God in this mouse? Yes, God's everywhere. Is God, uh, you know, find any point in outer space, anywhere in the galaxy with nothing there? Is God there? Yeah, God's everywhere. And God's infinite. So if God is everywhere, and God's infinite, how is it that there's more God one place than another place? How is it that one thing has God's presence dwelling on it? And what does it mean for it to be holy to begin with? Shouldn't, shouldn't everything be holy? If everything is in God's place, if God is everywhere, why isn't everything holy? And how are there levels of infinite holiness? God's beyond everything, so once God's somewhere, I'm done. That's infinitely holy. You can't get better than that. And it can't get worse than that. That's just the same everywhere. Is that a question? No, okay. So we asked this question and we learned 
that when we look at the structure, I've got some one person coming to class, two more. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Welcome, uh, welcome. I had a challenge today. I got it. I got it. Well, now the challenge is uh, to, to join us and add your, oh, add your thoughts. Tell me your name. Thank you. Do you remind me your name? I'm Barry Seifman. Barry. Yeah. Barry with a B. B with a B. B. Good. <laughs> Wonderful. Happy to have you with us, Barry. Welcome. Thank you. Now, there was a, I wrote under construction without pre-notice. Okay. So, you know, we are, we are streaming this, so, so the, the whole room is picked up, but I'm glad you made it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, so when we look at, we're looking at the relationship of the soul to the body to try and understand the relationship of God to creation, how there could be something called the dwelling of the Shekhinah, how there could be some place that's more holy. So now we're going into some detail about how, how the soul relates to the body, how the soul relates to the body. In the soul's essence, which is the first aspect of the soul, the soul is just pure, one, uncompounded, simple, pashut. So you don't have aspects of the soul. You don't have a, a spot in the soul that corresponds to the power of sight. You don't have the spot in the essence of the soul that corresponds to the power of speech, which is creating these words, ultimately. The soul is just one thing, completely simple, essential. And that soul, by the way, relates to every part of my body exactly the same. How do I know? Because my hands are alive, and my ears are alive, and my brain is alive, and my heart is alive. And one is not equally alive than another. They're all just alive. And the soul is equally hidden in all those places. You can't point to my finger and say, aha, I'm looking into the microscope and I'm seeing a soul. You can't do the same with a brain. You can't do the same with a toe. It's equally enlivening every part of the body. It's equally there and it's equally hidden throughout the body. There's no way to see it physically. That's the essence of the soul and it's simple. Part one of the soul. Part two of the soul is called a gilui, a gilui, there's, there's a revelation, and we can call that etzem hachayus if we want, if you want the Hebrew term, that's the essence of life, and that revelation from the soul, that package, let's call it, that emerges from the soul, that does have each of the powers that will now start to enliven and, and enclose themselves in the body. So in that gilui, that emerges from the simple essence of the soul. There is the power of motion. There is the power of sight. There is the power of hearing. And where does that emerge? Where does that appear? Where does it manifest? In the brain. That's the third component. We need a central place where that package will emerge and be manifest. And from there, it will shine like rays from a sun into each of the rooms of a house. So. If my brain is a big window and the sun's coming in, now that sunlight will also flow into a side room and a guest room, etc. And that is those powers as they flow now into each vessel of the body. And the nose, which is a vessel for smell, receives the light from that package that's good for smell. But they're all there manifest. They're all there um, dwelling, so to speak, in the brain before they then flow into the rest of the body. So three components we've described about the soul. This wants to be clear. There is the soul's essence, which is simple, uncompounded, indivisible, one. There's the gilui, that package that emerges from the soul, which does have components. And then there is the uh, transfer center, whatever you want to call it. There is the first place that, that emerges, and that is the brain. So three stages in the soul's uh, development as it flows through our body. Is that, is that clear to everybody online, everybody here? Oh, say it again. Uh, you want the whole thing again or which part? <laughs> Last little part, the three parts. Yeah, so three parts of the soul's development are one, the simple essence of the soul, which is not divisible. Two, the package that is revealed from that essence, which does have powers within it. And then three, the brain, where that package is revealed. Those are three, call them stages of the soul's development we want to understand before we go back to the original idea, which was how God relates to the world. Is that, is that clear all around? Any questions? I have a question. 
All right, let's do one here and then one online. No, I, I don't understand how it can be divided into three separate sections. This question is, how can you divide it into three separate sections? Because I said the soul is one, essential, undivided. Right. Now I'm dividing it, right? So right. Right. I got this, I got this, uh, you know, I got this bowling ball that, that you can't saw in half. And I'm like, no, I'm going to break it into three pieces, right? <laughs> so how does that work? <clears throat> so there's a difference between something's essence and then how something manifests. Right, something essence so and, the, and how it manifests. The there's one Brad Pitt, and it's only him. He can only be one place at one time. He can only say one thing at once. He, you know, there's one of him, and yet he makes a movie, and now the movie is all over the world in, in countless, uh, you know, homes on a TV and countless theaters. And so the projection from him as a person, when he plays a role, you can say it's now in many places. And by the way, it's also earning earning money. So there's also financially the movie exists in that world. Right? And he, as a star, is able to now add money and he's saying, okay, financially, his movie, his career has earned this much, right? There's still only one Brad Pitt. So, essentially, Brad Pitt is just one person and yet, he's able to be in many screens, I can be watching him, you can be watching him different times. The soul is like that. So it's different categories, even though the soul is essentially, in its essence, one. But the, the essence of the soul, that's a different category than the manifestation of the soul. Good question. Okay. Good question. Decent answer? No. No, he still's not happy. <laughs> He's not happy. Look, I, <laughs> ultimately you're putting your finger on something of a paradox. And it's the same paradox we have with God, right? So the same question you're asking, how can it be indivisible? But now you're saying it's here and not here. And as parts, that's the same question. We're saying God's indivisible. And yet God's dwelling here and not here. So that paradox is bothering you. That's always there. This is just abstract. You have to try and wrap your mind around what it means for the soul to be essential and also obviously what it means to have powers that are manifest. Different categories. It sound like a cell dividing. Well, I think it's just how you talk about it, what you emphasize when you talk about it. Yeah, it's not, it's not like a cell dividing it, because it's, it's the cell. essential soul is not now reproducing itself and getting components, something that can have components is emerging from the simplicity of the soul. But something that emerges from it, it's not it anymore. It's a different stage of how it manifests. I think your phrase manifestation covered it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The essential, essential essence of something, the essence of something or the manifestation of something. Those are the categories that distinguish what we're... Okay. Hey, Susan, did that, did that cover yours or you got a new... That's a nod. We're good? I didn't have a question. Oh, sorry. I have a lot of questions, but not one right now. <laughs> oh, who, sorry, who online? I lost track. Uh, pardon me. It was Linda or Paula? We're good. <clears throat> All right, so if that's clear for everybody, let's go on in the text. Uh, well, and so now, now that we have, sorry, let me, let me frame a little more. Now you understand the soul, essence, Giloi with powers and then the brain. Now we're going back to the Ein Sof, to God, <clears throat> and saying, now how is it that we can understand the idea of God dwelling, God's presence dwelling, when God's one and everywhere? So it's the same thing. My soul is a reflection of God. It's in God's image. And, and by looking at myself, I can try and understand the completely abstract infiniteness of God. So just like the soul is one undefined simple, so God's essence is one undefined simple. That's, that's the total infinite undefined simplicity, right? There's absolutely no division possible, absolutely no definition possible. You can't, even, you can't even think about how it has no definition because you're already excluding other things as soon as you think about it. So our, our brain can't touch, right? We can, we can understand what it isn't. It isn't definable, <clears throat> but our brain can't possibly touch that. It's like as the altruist said, is trying to trying to reach a deep math problem with with you know with a pair of tongs because my arm isn't long enough, right? And if I'm complaining, it's too deep for me. I can't get. It. I need a pair of tongs so I can reach down and get it. Saying no, your your arm doesn't reach in that kind of depth. That's an intellectual depth. You're confusing the term. Same thing. My brain is never going to be able to grasp infinite oneness. Right? That's outside of what the brain can do. And no matter how big a brain, no matter how much you think about it, no matter how abstract and smart you are, you still 
It's like saying I, I need I need a pair of tongs to get to that math problem because it's too deep for me, right? That, that's it's a different capacity when you talk about the infinite. So that's God's simplicity. Then something flows out of God, which we're going to call the Shekhinah. It's a package of powers that then can relate to the world. And as we'll learn, there is also a third component that corresponds to the brain where that emerges. And that's in the next chapter. All right, so let's go through the Alter Rebbe's words. We are on page 790. We finished 793. Start. Let's start 793 at the top, now the variation. And let's let's start online with Eleanor, so you can unmute. Vahine. Now the variation in receiving the functional powers and life force by the organs of the body from the soul, each organ. And in Hebrew, Vahine, ein shinui kabalat hakochot vechayot vechayut shebe evre haguf min haneshama. So now he's asking the question. Does the soul have 613 components that correspond to each of the uh, each of the powers that happen in the body, or is the soul simple, and it's only in the body in the manifestation that there are powers? So this variation, where obviously my eye has a power of seeing and and my hand has a power of grasping and motion. Mitzad atzma umahuta shiye mahuta veatzmuta mid chalek leramach. Chalakim shonim mitlabshim beramach mekomot kefi tziur chelke mekomot evre haguf. Let's go with uh, let's go with uh, Linda, Paula, Susan. So Linda, go ahead. Receiving from the soul a life force and power in a different form does not derive from the soul's essence and being. That we should say that its being and essence is divided into two hundred and forty-eight part, different parts which are enclosed in 248 locations, according to the designs of the various locations of the body's organs. And so the altar says, clearly, that's not the case. The soul itself does not have the soul component of seeing within it, and the soul component of thought, and the soul component of walking, and the soul component of emotion. The soul is just essential soul. And you can take the Alter Rebbe's words for it as one of the greatest Kabbalistic masters who's lived. Um, he, there's also proofs that I think the last Rebbe gave where he said, if the soul was absolutely simple and didn't have, no, it's, it's a different proof, no, I'll, I'll skip that. Let's just take it on faith that, that that's what the Alter Rebbe is saying. The soul itself is simple, the soul does not have pieces, it's not compounded. Because <laughs> according to this, it would follow that the soul's essence and being is designed in a physical design and a likeness and structure similar to the structure of the body, God forbid. Just as the organs of the body have various shapes and forms, so according to this outlook are the functional powers which still within the soul different from each other in form. But again, we cannot accept this. So the soul is a spiritual being, which means for starters, it's above space and above time. So if something's a spiritual being above space and time, how can you say it has a power of motion? But my soul has a power for walking from one place to another. It's above space. What does the soul know about space? How can you say the soul uh, is able to see something outside of itself? Well, outside the physical, what does sight mean? Right? What, what are light waves? What, what is an object that light waves are bouncing off? So if the soul is completely spiritual, then how can you say that it has properties that are essentially physical? And by the way, temporal too, there's also time involved, right? So, so like for something to change, for me, for me to speak, I need time. You know, to say the words and to express something that was in me, that's the out of me, you go on, right? So you, we can't accept that the soul is like the body related to physical form, related to space and time uh, dimensions, because the soul's above that to begin with. Rather, Ele Kula Etzemechad Ruchani Pashut Mufshat Mikotsur Gashmi Umipchinat Vegeremakom Amida Ugvul Gashmi. 
Rather is the soul entirely a single spiritual entity. It is one, a single entity, to a spiritual ent entity. It's a single entity, its oneness is plain and uncompounded. As a spiritual entity, its spirituality is in a form which is divested of any physical design and of any type of definition of physical space, measure, or limitations. All right, so these are, these are the key concepts in understanding that first piece. The soul is, in its atzmus, in its es essential essence, that's the etzim of the soul, it's echad, it's one, single, Ruhani, it's spiritual, so it's not, not one like that microphone is one. It's one a different way. And also it's pashut, simple, which means it's plain and uncompounded. So that, that's one microphone, but within it there's buttons, there, there's a diaphragm that you can hear, there, there's, a, there's a mesh. There's different components of that microphone, even though it's one microphone. The soul is not one like that. The soul is one in a completely simple sense, which means without definition, without any complexity, without any composition of any kind, just completely simple. And not simple like, simple in the, in the English term of, of not intelligent. It's not at all like that. Simple simple is not a diminutive term. Pashut is a very, very lofty term. Something that is so essential that it, there's no division and there's no definition to it. That's That has a much higher potential than something that has parts and components. Is it fair to say that the soul is just there as, as an energy force or whatever, and that the, be, the different body parts, because of the nature of the way they are, get what they need from the soul. Is, is it fair to say that the soul is there more as an energy source and the different body parts get their power they need based on their function? Um, I, I'd be very careful about that. I know that, like here at Temple, a lot of people look at spirituality and even God as sort of like that energy source, right? Like, like I put my phone, you know, in a place and there, there's some kind of a magnetic thing that's powering the phone. And then the phone takes that power and turns it into something that I can relate to programming, you know, um, because now you're going with simple as in can't beat me at checkers, right? A power source, a power source can't beat me at checkers. Well, right? I'm whereas, just, whereas I'm just using the word power, but it's yeah. just there and whatever the different body parts need it gets it from that yeah but i just i'd be careful about anything that simplifies it to the oh. point of it's just the power source driving because okay. it's not that it's simple in that it has every possible um power that could emerge they're still in potential not existing but it's above them it's not below them so a lot of people hear this stuff and they think okay i can relate to god as a power source for the universe but that that's simple in the sense of the electric current going to this computer is not aware of me. The electric current going to this computer is not having a conversation with me. It can't argue with me. It can't make a joke. It doesn't have a sense of humor. It's simple in that sense. This is simple meaning all those things, it's above them, right? My soul has the power of humor. My soul has the power of intellect. My soul has the power of speech. They just don't exist there because it's simple, but the power can emerge from it. So it is simple as in higher not lower. Does that make sense? And it's difficult because how do I how do I relate to God that's so abstract and infinite? One way to do it is to say, okay, I'm just going to relate to God like it's the power source of the universe. But if God can't tell a joke and if God can't beat me in checkers, something's wrong, right? Because God God is infinitely intelligent. God has an infinite sense of humor. God has an infinite stage presence. God's infinite. It all emerges from God. So that, that's what the elder is. So, so I'm not saying that's all it is. Yeah. I'm just saying that's a part of what. An analogy. Yeah. Yeah. So as long as it's clear, you could say it's it's an it's an uncompounded power that now a uh, specific power emerges from it, if you like, and all those powers are in in potential, but mm -hmm. simple, uncompounded. We got lost in this rabbit hole last week. I don't want to go too deep because <laughs> I'll get a snort from from Dan <laughs> at the end of the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're, we're past that. <laughs> I remember that every time I do call on God, the line's busy. <laughs> How's that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's other problems in the world. I, I mean, a line can be busy and a person could just be listening, right? So, True. yeah, yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, doesn't always answer. So rather, yeah, mitzad, right, we're mitzad? Yeah. Mitzad, mahuta, v'atzmuta, so Susan, let's do two. Are you uh, unmuting? There you there go. There I go. The soul is free of all such dimensions by virtue of its intrinsic being and essence. In fact, the soul is so plain and free of all these, even when it is actually enclothed within the organs. They cannot affect any change in the soul. Therefore, the Alta Rebbe continues. Right, and, and another proof that's often given for this is, my soul is aware of the pain that my brain is feeling, but it's not actually affecting the soul. I mean, it is affecting the soul. It's different, that's a different thing. God's completely unaffected by Let's leave that. That's gonna that's gonna get us somewhere. Erase that. Gashmi. <laughs> go ahead. And it is not valid to say concerning the soul's being in essence that it is in the brain of the head more than in the feet. Since its being in essence is not subject to the concept and dimension of physical space and limitation, it is therefore impossible to attribute to the soul this limitation of being more in the head than in the feet. All right, so the essence of the soul, if it's above space, then how, what does the soul know about I'm here more than I am here? Right, how could there be one place where the soul is more and one place where it's less? The, the soul essentially relates to the entire body as just a soul. The body's alive and the soul is essential. And and there's no difference to this from the soul's perspective between my fingertip and, and the center of my brain or a chamber of my heart because that's a spatial difference and it does not apply to the essential nature of the soul. So the soul, you're just alive. And also it's equally hidden. You can't find it any more in the brain and the heart than you can in the fingertip, right? No, no one has gotten a, a electron microscope picture of the soul yet. Although, have you seen those crazy, do you see the crazy uh, high-speed um, camera that's like getting pictures of light waves? Has anyone seen that? No. It's absolutely nuts. Like, it blows my mind. Like, there's these guys, how you get a camera to have that many frames that you can actually see the light wave moving is, it's, mm. it's, 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 look it up. These like slow-mo guys, they, they caught it. And you can see the light wave moving across an object, an actual light wave. It's but even with that, you can't see the soul, right? The soul is not, it's, it's hit, equally hidden everywhere in the body. I'm going Okay, you feel like uh, reading for us, Barry? Rather. Can I read through this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Rather. Rather, 613 kinds of functional powers and vital forces are included within the soul, within its being and essence, to become actualized and to emerge from this concealment and inclusion within the soul's essence. Previously, while still included within the soul's essence, they are only in potentia and therefore hidden within the soul, not even as functional powers which are revealed as such while still included within the soul. In other words, within the soul is concealed a potential for 613 functional powers to become actualized and to emerge from concealment. As here we're looking at this paradox where you have something simple, there's nothing in it, it's not defined, and yet it has, from it can emerge powers that have definition. And the same issue happens, as we said, with, with God, with the infinite. We call God omnipotent, and that's a strange word in English because it makes me think of something that could just, you know, when you're a kid, and you're like, my shield is going to be your sword. Well, my sword has super duper shield busting powers. Well, I have armor that can block it. And you, you think, well, God just wins that game. God's at the end of that game. God can just, anything you can think of God is more powerful. Anything you can imagine you can do, God can do that. That's, in my mind, what omnipotent means. In Hebrew, it's hakol yachol. Hakol yachol, anything that can be. So the world is existing now. That's one possible articulation of reality with every single detail of the world, every molecule everywhere in the cosmos, and every motion 
we're feeling and, and every response of every animal and every being and how every light wave is reflecting off every tiny ripple of every body of water. It's all here now. But that's just one articulation of infinite possible articulations of what reality could be. It's already mind-blowingly infinite. But all those possible articulations of every possible reality of the world, including every detail within the world, that all exists in potential within God. But God's simple and nothing's there. Right? That's absolute pure pasha. That, that's, that's true infinite oneness. Right? So everything that could possibly be, every possible scenario, every anything, that all already exists in potential within God. But only in, in that it can emerge through the same process we described through the soul. So try and picture in your mind everything that could possibly be. Hakol yakol, everything that can be. That is what we call omnipotent. So it's not that God can do anything and God's stronger than anything. It's that this is just one slice, one frame, one option, right? In the, if you want, you know, if you look at it as, as a file and, and there's, you know, there's film clips in there, this is just one frame, each frame containing an entire universe, each universe containing every detail within that universe, and there's infinite frames, it just goes on in all directions, in all dimensions, everywhere. So anything we can conceive as possibly happening, that all exists within God, hakol yakol. But it's not there in God the same way these powers are not there in the essence of our soul. The essence of God, you can't say, oh, this world is here and this option is here and, and this power is here. You can't point at things in God. You can't define things. You can't get definition. That's the essence of God. But when it comes to the Shekhinah, right, where we see this, this package that emerges from God, now you start to have dimensions. You could say there, we learned the Sfirot, we learned the Kabbalah. You could say that's, that's love within the Shekhinah. That's Chesed she, she Bemalchut, right? We'll learn the terms again. And there you could say you start to have powers that will now relate to different levels of the spiritual worlds and different aspects of even physical reality. So you can see it's starting to emerge. There is an absolute parallel between this question of how the Shekhinah can dwell on something and this question of how the soul is flowing through the body. Yeah? Let's go on. So is the soul part of the Shekhinah or part of God? Well, it's all the same. The, the soul... I mean, that's a different question. The soul emerges from Shechina. So Jewish souls emerge from Shechina. When you call Shechina Knesset Yisrael, the, the assembly of, of, of Israel, that is the spiritual place where Jewish souls emerge from, right? So that's how, that's how in terms of, in terms of uh, the soul entering the world in reality, that's how the soul relates to it. But in this metaphor that we're using, in this mashal we're using to try and explain how God is relating to the world, the soul is the the soul is the uh, metaphor for God, and how the soul flows through the body is the metaphor for how God flows through the world and fills the universe. Okay. Okay. In order to animate the 248 organs <clears throat> and 365 blood vessels of the body through the functional powers of the divine soul, becoming enclosed within the animating or vital soul, which also possesses the corresponding 248 and 365 functional powers and vital forces. And by the way, not a coincidence that there's 248 positive commandments, 365 negative commandments. And we learned in the past that that, because we are a model of God, and that is God's intellect, we're built on that. And the organs, those are the functions, those are the mitzvahs, and our soul has, within its manifestation, it has components that correspond to each of those mitzvahs and to each of our organs. And then to the blood vessels, that's how you keep your energy intact within where it's supposed to go. And that is like a negative commandment. I just don't break a negative commandment the same way I don't want to puncture, God forbid, a blood vessel and my energy is leaking out. So if I walk around hating another Jew, I'm breaking a negative commandment. Well, yeah, don't hate, don't hold a grudge, that one. Also breaking a positive commandment. Or if I, uh, you know, if I uh, lie or tell a story that hurts someone, 
I'm breaking a negative commandment, right? Don't gossip. And now it's like I've punctured one of my vessels and my energy is leaking out. It's not going to my organs. It's just feeding negativity, right? So, so we don't want to go deep into that, but that's why there's 613 total components to this gyuli, this package that comes out of the soul, just like there's 613 total positive negative commandments. Now, vihine al hamshachat kold hatoyag mine kochot vichayut me helem hanishama al haguf la hachoyoto. Go ahead, Noreen. You want to continue? Yeah. Now, concerning the flow of all the 613 kinds of functional powers and vital forces which are drawn from the concealment of the soul, where they are previously hidden, and from where they are now drawn to the body to animate it. Right, so, if we are. Uh, if we're good with this differentiation, the, the, these categories of soul's essence, the gilu, the manifestation that has different powers available, and then the brain where that is revealed, now we're going to go on, right? Concerning the flow of all these powers which come out of the soul's concealment to animate the body, where does it happen first? Aleha amru she'ikar mishkana. Let's start over with uh, Eleanor, if you will, then. Let's do Eleanor, Linda, Paula, Susan. Concerning this flow, the sages have said that the principal dwelling place and abode of this flow and revelation of the previously concealed powers and forces is entirely situated in the brains of the head. So I think I think that's intuitive. Maybe the only, as we discussed, maybe the only outlier is the heart, where I wouldn't say intuitively, you know, my heart seems to have its own warmth, its own way of relating to the world, and maybe my heart also receives something directly from the soul that then flows to the body. Uh, like that, that intuitively, I'd say, okay, you got you got an argument there. But certainly, with everything else. My brain is aware that my hand is moving. My hand is not aware that my brain is thinking about something, right? My, my, my tongue is aware of what things taste like, and my brain is, is aware of that sensation, but my tongue is not aware that my brain is having a memory, right? So, so my, my, uh, the seed of my soul is, seems to be more connected to my brain first than everything else, and my brain is aware of everything else. My brain is directing everything else just naturally. Um, and the author will say, even the heart, even the heart, which also has a, f a function of a sending life force to the rest of the body, the heart also receives its power from the brain, and that all the powers that are within the heart of emotion and compassion and, and attunement, they all actually also are in the brain first. The brain has every one of those powers. That whole package is completely manifest in the brain, including the powers of the brain itself, which which you know, chokhmah bin and dat, right, intellect, do not flow to the other parts of the body anywhere near the same way they are in the brain. The heart has intellect, the gut has intellect, but the brain has a much more powerful intellect. So the chabad is also there in the brain and not in that same way in the rest of the body. <clears throat> so that is, that's going to be the model for this third piece, and that's going to be the puzzle piece that fits and answers the question, how can the shechina dwell on something? And ultimately, it's going to be called the Holy of Holies, which corresponds to the brain, and that is the Chabad of each world, but we'll get to that. Right? But it's clear in my mind that my brain is the place where this gili, this manifestation of the various powers of the soul, is revealed more than anywhere else and before anywhere else. But the essence of the soul is the same there as anywhere else, completely hidden and relates to it equally, enlivening my brain just like my, my, my finger. That distinction makes sense? Yeah. I heard a joke um, that I think, I think possibly is not funny at all. <laughs> and so I always take that as a challenge. I'm wondering, like, can, I'm wondering if, if it'll be funny to us or not. If there's a way to tell it that can be funny, and I, just, just for my own curiosity, we'll take a little joke break and then we'll dive back in. Is that cool with you guys? Sure. Anyway, like, feel free to, you know, you can do thumbs down online if you want. So this guy, Abe, this is really unrelated. Normally, a joke is related to what we're talking about. Well, maybe it is related. Okay, no, it is related. We, we'll tie it back. So this guy Abe comes from the old country, and he comes to you know to, to the United States, 
and and he wants to make a living. He's got to raise a family, so he sets up a nice shoe shop. You know, he likes shoes and just you know traditional shoes. You get you know your loafers and and your more casual shoes. You know, basic shoes. Always loyal to his customers and. and he doesn't do good business, but he does business, and he's surviving, right? He's just kind of making ends meet and helping his family, but, you know, n- not not well-to-do by any means. Decades later, after he's been in business for a long time, and he's, you know, Abe the shoe guy, these two young kids come, and they've been, they got, they've been to business school. You know, they say, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. The whole shoe industry needs to be revamped, uh, you know, in our part of town. We're going we're gonna to start something new, and by the way, we're going to put him completely out of business because we don't need him here. Right? So they're not very kind young people either. So they buy the store to the right of his store. They buy the store to the left of his store. They rent it. And now they, they, they tear everything out. They put in big windows. They use their, you know, their education and their fancy marketing to put in like the finest shoes and all these styles. And they're all on these glass windows and with mirrors. And it's just, it's gorgeous, right? And Abe is freaking out. He's like, I'm going to go out of business for sure. How am I going to even support my family? I'm going to be like out of my home. What am I going to do? He goes to his wife and he's like, I see them putting these stores in. I mean, the minute they open, like, we're done. Uh, Like, what do I do? So I says, here's what you do. And she whispers in his ear. So that week he goes and he gets his sign taken down. And he has a company come and lift up a new sign with just two words on it. And the two words say, main entrance. (laughs) Oh, he got a laugh. (laughs) All right. It's a funny joke. It's a funny joke. Okay. I wasn't sure it was a funny joke. There you go. So like that was the main entrance for this store, the brain is the main entrance for this power of, of uh, our souls. And that's where, boom, everything comes in for the first time. And from there, it goes out. Although, look, I hope Abe, you know, did well. <laughs> and concerning, so I forget where we are now. Someone help me. Uh, okay, middle of 796. Okay. Therefore, it is they, the brains, which first receive the power and life force appropriate to them according to their composition and character, namely intellect, which is divided into the three intellectual faculties called Chabad, Chochma Bina Da'at, and the faculty of thought and whatever pertains to the brain. All these receive their life force from the soul before the part, the other parts of the body. So A, the brain receives it first, its own life force, which is Chabad. We've learned about the first three of, of the Sfirot, which are also the first three powers of the, of the soul, which is inspiration, cogitation, and then knowledge, which is kind of relating to the information intellectually. Sorry, relating to the intellectual information emotionally, dot. So that those intellectual powers, we call them seichel, that is received by the brain, which is its own power, and it's received by the brain before the rest of the organs. But on top of that, as you'll say, the brain receives all the other powers in that package as well. Go ahead, Dan. And not only this, <clears throat> that the brains receive their own life force before the other organs, but also the overall flow of all the individual streams of vitality to the other organs is also first included and enclosed in the brains of the head before it becomes revealed in the individual organs. And by the way, for us who've been learning this uh, together for a while, and he'll say this later, this is why the big tool we used in our first section of the Tanya of how we can become a Bainani, how we can have thought, speech, and action always at their peak, it's because Hamoach Shalit Halev, the mind controls the heart. And now that we see the technical order in which the soul enters the body, it makes sense because the brain's upstream. Right? Everything that's coming to the heart, it's first going through the brain. So how the brain is framing the world how the brain is directing consciousness to think, that is creating grooves in my neuroplasticity and is determining what emotions I feel about anything, what emotional framework I use for anything. So if my brain is always saying, thank God everything's a blessing, I know my physical eyes are telling me this is trouble, but thank God it's a blessing. I'm just gonna keep saying that. I'm gonna keep thinking that. 
that's creating a groove where my heart will also feel gratitude and maybe even when I hit a real rough spot, be more resilient, right? Because the mind is controlling the heart. Whereas if I let the heart's little reactions that pop into the mind, I let those rule the roost, now it's backwards. Now I've got my instinct controlling the brain and now I'm just using the brain to rationalize my own self-centered, uh, my animal soul instincts and impulses, right? But because the soul is entering the brain first and from there, the life force for the heart is being is radiating to the heart just naturally by how we were created. As the author Rebbe said earlier, that's why the brain can always control the heart. And no matter what the heart wants, the brain can think the exact opposite at any point. Right? We have that total freedom. Uh, go ahead, Barry, and, and is there. From there, the uh, brain, no, above, yeah, and, it is there in the and brain. is there in the brain that the core and the source of the set flow exists in a form in which the light and vitality of the entire soul are revered, revealed. In other words, when the general flow of vitality reaches the brain, then the light and, the, and vitality of the entire body begin to be revealed. And so here it's like sun is often likened to sun flowing into a room, and then it also flow into side rooms and under a desk and wherever else. There's some light that goes everywhere else, except that each room has its own its own capacity. So the light that flows into my hand, that's now revealed as the power of motion that was in the soul that first entered the brain. And it first enters the brain through Kabbalah. It's complicated because we, we're going to call. We're going to call. I don't know if that's a yes or no question. You're going to. I'm going to go on for a while. I'm going to ignore that question. Is that okay? It enters through the brain, and the brain receives chabad, its own properties, within that. You said earlier that it goes. I, I I know, but I say that about the worlds. The worlds I call the kadosh. The holy of holies of the world we call the chabad of the worlds, and there we say that's like the brain of the world. But here you have an actual physical brain. And I'm saying the brain receives the power of cognition, which is Chabad itself. But now are the other powers coming through Chabad in the brain that I, I, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Good, very good, very, very astute question. Thank you. V'chol ha-kochot mitpashtim me-hamoach kanoda kishamu ikar mishkan hashma chula. Oh, misham, sorry. From there the brain radiance flows to all the other organs, each of which then receives the functional power and vital force appropriate to it according to its composition and character. The power of sight is revealed in the eye, the power of hearing in the ear, and so on. And this is nice to know. It's nice. We Rarely do we get a map of how our soul flows through our body as clearly as this. And trying to optimize the soul to flow through the body and, and be a Bainani if I can, or at least be a high-functioning practitioner spiritually. It's nice to know what the map is and, and where it's going on. Vichol, and I'll finish this. Vichol kochot mit pashtim me hamor kanoda kisham hu ikar mishkan hashama kula bifrinat gilui. But all functional powers flow from the brain as is known. For there in the brain is located the principal dwelling place of the entire soul in a revealed form. And there he's put the finger on the button of how we're going to solve this problem of how infinite, infinite essential godliness can be more revealed one place than another. Because now you're seeing, on the one hand, the soul in essence relates to everything equally is hidden everywhere in the body. On the other hand, this package of revealed powers, that's definitely revealed in the brain before anywhere else and completely revealed in the brain before anywhere else. And in fact, flows from everywhere else through the brain, right? And the same thing now, that's the solution we're gonna have to what it means for the Shekhinah to dwell. Because we'll see in the spiritual worlds of creation, each of them has something corresponding to the brain, which there it is, the Chabad of that world, the Chochmah Bin and Dat, uh, which are the Sfirot of that world before that world is created, right? This is 
this is the godliness within that world and that godliness will flow down you can't say down but emerging out of it will come all the emotional attributes the emotional spirit that will all flow into malchus of that world which is eventually the shrina of that world and that now dwells and creates the world and that can relate to something in the world as holiness and something else as not holy and it's complex because there's many spiritual worlds there's four categories and infinite worlds within each category and it all pops out here in the physical world and there you have the godliness of the physical world but also even we had the holy of holies physically where where the shina dwelled right and that was the physical correspondence to the chabad of the physical world or even <laughs> As we learned in the early temple, it was it was directly from Chabad of Bria that 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 the Shekhinah was dwelling on the Holy of Holies in the temple. So the Rebbe will go through all this. This was exactly what Noreen brought up earlier about the dwelling in the different parts of the body according to what it means. Is this what is what she said? Is it what she said? Remember, you brought up yeah. the fact that yeah. it dwells in, in the brain differently than the, the, the toe. Yeah. Is that what you up yeah, because of the nature of, of the different body parts, it take, gets what it needs to energize. Yeah, for sure now at that energy. point. Once it has been manifest in the brain, once, now you have something called gilui, okay. which, is, which is the powers of the soul, and they're manifest in the brain. Now 100%. Now because my hand is a vessel for movement, now the light that has been revealed will flow into my hand, and the power of movement is revealed there. How would you spell gilui in, in English? G-I-L. U, uh, I, yeah. I, I do that. And Rick, I think in pure chaos, they didn't they think the brain was in the heart, so that's what the difference yeah, was. With, maybe, yeah. Maybe that's show me, show me thought. the, show me the line you're thinking. Of, but the heart is a seat. The heart is an organ of of um, perception and thought in Judaism, right? right? So, so it, yeah, you know things in your heart. You sense yeah, with your heart. That's what they believed. Yeah, yeah, but it's not that they didn't believe the brain was also that. It's that they were aware they of what we're just discovering that, that the heart also is that. Yeah. In, yeah. In the heart. And the, and the heart, uh, you know, both in neuroplasticity and the sort of multi brain model that's now emerging in neuroplasticity, the heart has a different kind of intellect than the brain has, right? Where the brain is called cold calculating, the brain is, is looking at vast, vast amounts of information and, and is intellectually kind of putting pieces together. The heart is about attuning and about warmth and about relationship and about you know how a person lands on me and, and the heart is able to have a different wavelength and has a different thought process than the brain does. And that's also the Jewish tradition is that, that obviously Pirkei Avot were aware that they were thinking with their brains, but they were also aware that they were sensing with their heart something. And in Kabbalah, the heart can actually further see further than the brain. When it comes to this question we're dealing with, God's essence and God can be infinite, and what are you talking? Like the brain is just thrown off by that. In that bandwidth, the heart is actually more powerful and can see further than the brain. And sometimes the heart does. The brain has to rely on the heart, especially with faith, right? The brain, the heart is better at faith than the brain is at faith. So sometimes you want to use your brain to be the compass bearing but use your heart to be the telescope to look because the heart will see faith where the brain just sees confusion but that that's outside of what we're learning here here we're here we're learning about the dwelling of the shina we want to keep it relatively simple that the the soul does emerge first in the brain and from there it sends the heart its own energy now let's finish with just a short meditation because we like i said these are great ideas we want to understand them but you also want to apply them and use our brain to insert them into our heart and, and generate emotions. So very easy. I don't know if you've meditated, Barry. Yeah. So we'll, we'll uh, Jewish meditation is much simpler than perhaps some systems from the East that we may have learned. We just want to sit in a relaxed posture, close our eyes. And let your breathing now come to its fullest, smoothest expression. If you can, close your mouth. If you're comfortable, breathe through your nostrils. Take a moment to scan your body from the crown of your head, relaxing your face, your eyes, smooth eyelids, 
tongue heavy in your mouth, throat free, shoulders dropping, spine nice and long, and ribs just floating off of that. Feel the weight of your body through your relaxed hips. Toes can be loose on the ground, you don't have to clench, just relaxed. And all your weight falling, muscles hanging off bones. And let's bring our breath to its full expression and even out each of the four stages. We'll breathe four together to breathe in, four together to keep that beautiful air inside, four together to release through the nose, and four together to stay empty and clear. Starting with me, breathing in on one, two, three, four, and keep it in, two, three, four, easy out two, three, four, and stay empty, two, three, starting over on one, two, three, four, nice and full, three, four, back out, two, three, four, empty, two, start over on your own pace, just keep going that even, even flow, Let's open up what we're calling our wisdom gateway. That is the space between the end of the in-breath and the beginning of the out-breath. In that space, after the end of the in-breath, before the beginning of the out-breath, there's an opening and emptiness. And that will be our wisdom gateway for this meditation. Just sort of open it and stay there through the breathing cycle if you can. Keep breathing. Let that wisdom gateway clarify in your mind. And nice big visuals. Also sound if you like. Place yourself within it. Now in that wisdom gateway, let's put this divine concept. Through my flesh I see God. And that in looking at my own mind, my own heart, I'm looking a map of God, I'm seeing a reflection of God, I'm learning about the infinite. Yeah. From my flesh I see God. Put that concept in your wisdom gateway and let your mind start to delve into all the details, all the dimensions of that divine concept. Yeah. The direction here, the flow is for the concept to fill the mind completely rather than empty the mind. Allow your, allow your cogitation to go deeper into the details. Allow the ramifications to widen in your mind. Allow the flow to lengthen for all other interpretations of this idea. Just fill the mind to the brim like a cup of wine. From my flesh I see God. Good work. As always, if you're watching, if you're one of the many people in our community watching online in the future, you can open your eyes, pause your device, and then keep meditating with your eyes closed. It's all good. It's good to spend 10, 15, 20 minutes each day meditating on a concept. But we're out of time here in the class, so we'll open our eyes, wiggle our wiggly things. <laughs> And uh, good to have you here. Thank you for learning. We're nearing the end of uh, the Tanya. You know, I was talking a bit with Maya about uh, you know when we're done, we want to have a scene, we want to have a celebration that we finish the whole Tanya. So uh, anyone that's involved, uh, I'm going to figure out a date as we get closer. And at my home, I'll invite everyone to come and we'll have the last class where we finish chapter 53, have a l'chaim, have some snacks, celebrate. Uh, 
maybe have a lottery for what we're going to learn after this. But uh, Mark, it's several years of hard work going through the Tanya. So if you'd like to be at uh, the CIUM, as always, please email Maya and, and we'll let you know where it is. We'd love to have you if you've been learning with us at any point on the way. Thanks for joining us and see you next time.